Hello, my friends. Dennis Prager here in my home, my dog, my fireplace, the fireside chat. This is unrehearsed, unscripted, which is, by the way, a drop dangerous because I talk about very sensitive matters and it's, it would be easier to read from a teleprompter, for example, but I really want it to be as authentic and as heartfelt as possible. So what is this, about a 145? What, what are we up to? 142. 142. 142 fireside chats. You know, when I started, I didn't even think this would go to like four. I figured, ah, I'd give it a try. 142. By the way, there's a very interesting lesson to be learned before I officially begin, so to speak. What you do regularly really mounts up. That's a very important lesson. You don't have to do a massive amount. You just have to do something regularly. Whatever a good, I'm referring to something good, obviously, in your life, but it, it works. If you write a little every day, if you write for 20 minutes every day, you, you will be stunned at how good you get at writing, how expressive of yourself. I mean, even a diary or just thoughts. Anything that's done regularly. So this, this is once a week, but already there are 142 of them. And that's once a week for a half hour. That's not every day 20 minutes. You play piano every day for 20 minutes. It doesn't matter what it is. It, it's, it, it, you read something that's deep for 20 minutes a day. You, you'll end up reading incredible numbers of books. Good uh, r routine is critical for, uh, same with saving money. A lot of you are young. You start saving a little bit of money. Now you'll be a millionaire later in life. It's hard for you to imagine, but that's true. It mounts up with compound interest and so on. Of course, at the rate the, the government is printing money, it may not matter. <laughs> uh, that's a bitter laugh. Okay, let me just remind you that we have a sponsor for this, and that is thinker.org, but no E in thinker, T-H-I-N-K-R.org. That they do is they summarize the key ideas from new and noteworthy nonfiction giving you access to an entire library of great books in bite-sized form. Read or listen to hundreds of titles in a matter of minutes, from old classics like Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People to recent bestsellers like Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life. So expand your horizons in an easy way with thinker.org, T-H-I-N-K-R.org. Start a free trial and you'll be happy you did. Thinker.org. All right, we begin. No, no, we don't. We begin with me. <laughs> it's got video questions, so here you go. Yeah. All right, so I want to I actually, in rare case, I did make a couple of notes because I want to make four points, and I want to make sure I remember them. So I'd like to offer you some pretty powerful arguments against the notion that America is a racist society. As I have said uh, all of my life, that's the biggest libel of my lifetime. Libel means false charge. And it's a horrific charge against the least racist society that has many races in it. It's easy to be a non-racist, if you will, uh, in a country that's all one race, whatever that race might be. But uh, it, there's nothing like America. It is a land of opportunity for the vast majority of people. But let me give you some specific arguments that I suspect you have not heard. Uh, just logic. This is pure logic, these arguments, against the belief that the country is racist. Argument number one. I'm, I'm tempted to say proof number one, but I'll... I'll I'll be modest and just say, I'm not being modest about me. I'll be modest about the arguments. I'll call them arguments rather than proofs. Number one, if America were so racist, why would there be so many race hoaxes or even sometimes just mistakes? I, uh, in my most recent column, um, you can easily find it, that is Prager.com and uh, townhall.com, and then it goes to American Greatness and uh, 
and um, Daily Wire and many other places pick it up. And uh, in it, I give date and time. Date and time is the same thing. The, the date of a hoax. In other words, the most famous is Jussie Smollett, where you have this black actor claims, oh, I was attacked by white racists and they put a noose around my neck. But of course, we have, uh, the, uh, we have a video of his uh, uh, colleagues buying a rope for him to make up this whole thing. Everyone knows that he made up the entire thing. And uh, why, would, why are there so many hoaxes? I list 15, 15 documented hoaxes from mainstream media. Why are there so many hoaxes if there's so much racism? Why would people have to make up a noose or a swastika or, uh, or being called the N-word uh, out loud or scribbled on it? Why would they make it up? I'll give you a dramatic example. In the 1930s in Germany, you think any Jews made up an anti-Semitic incident? Of course not, because Germany was filled with anti-Semitism. So no Jew made up a, a, an anti-Semitic hoax. They, they would have been lucky if they had to make hoaxes up. That means that there aren't any real ones, or there are very few real ones. I can't, there, of course there are anti-Semitic, anti or I should say, uh, anti-black incidents in America. They're just very rare. That's why they're made up so often. That's argument number one. Why are there so many hoaxes? You wouldn't need them, would you? Here's another one. Why are we talking about slavery so much? Think about that. It ended, let's see, it ended uh, 1865. It's 35, 135, 155 years ago. Slavery ended in the United States 155 years ago. Why are we constantly talking about slavery? If things are so bad today, just talk about today. Right? Wouldn't that, wouldn't that make sense? This constant reference to things that happened a hundred and, and, and what did I just say? 145 years ago, whatever it is. And, and, and Jim Crow, which ended in the 60s, 1960s. That's 60 years ago. Because there's so little today. That's why. That's the reason for so much. Oh, America is the racist past, racist past, racist past. Okay. Uh, that's, to me, a pretty powerful statement about if you've got to go that far back, more than half the country's existence back, maybe it's because that's the only time you can really find all this racism. Number three is all the lies that are told. Like, like uh, Ferguson. We have a video out on Ferguson. Larry, Larry Elder gives it. Uh, you always hear about Ferguson and uh, the, uh, uh, the, the white police officer who, who killed Michael Brown. It was Michael Brown, correct? And uh, is that, check, check that, make, make sure that's the name. And anyway, it was, it was black, blacks on a jury who, who acquitted the officer. He, he wasn't indicted. See Larry Elder's video at PragerU. He tells you exactly what happened in Ferguson, Missouri. It's all a lie, Michael Brown. That, that it's all a lie that it was ra racism. It had nothing to do with racism. The officer was attacked. By the way, just out of curiosity, how do we even know that the terrible I incident with George Floyd was racist? We don't know that. Those guys had bad blood between them from, from the past. They knew each other, apparently. What does it have to do? It might be racist. It might not be racist. The case in Atlanta, where, where the, 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 did you see the officers talk to the guy for a half hour like they were his pals? Did they look like racist to you? He then fought them and then turned around after stealing an officer's taser to tase them. I don't know whether it was justified or not justified, the shooting of, of, the, of the black uh, man who was running away, but I don't remember his name, but the... Uh, but you can't say for sure this was racism. So we, we have a whole, often, a lot of lies about this. It's, 
you know how rare it is? I mean, this whole thing, the police are racist. According to the Washington Post, 15, the last year we have records for, 15 unarmed blacks were killed by police. 25 unarmed whites were killed by police. The police anti-white? How about this? Oh, well, so many blacks are in jail, disproportionate to their population. Well, do you know what? Most, nearly uh, everybody who's in jail for violence is male. Are we anti-male in this society? Or is it because males disproportionately are involved in violent crime, just as blacks disproportionately are involved in violent crime? Why does that say the society is racist? So we have to tell lies constantly. Here's another one, microaggressions. There is so little racism in the United States that they have to make up things as being racist when they're really not. I'll give you an example. This is official. University of California. You could check it out, obviously. You could check anything I say out. If you say there's only one race, the human race, that's called racist. But there's only one race, the human race, is the most beautiful thing you could say. That means you're not racist, by definition. If the only race you care about is the human race, how could you be racist? The whole microaggression thing is is nonsense. And why? Because they can't come up with the real stuff is almost never said, really racist stuff. So they make up stuff and call it racist. That's called microaggressions. All right? That's just an, another example of, of this. Here's, a, here's one more. Why did two million black Africans move to the United States in the last 50 years? According to a Gallup poll of, of uh, 2018, the country that most Africans want to, more than any other, not most Africans, the country that more Africans want to move to than any other in the world is the United States. Whoa, that's pretty powerful, isn't it? Are they stupid? Are all these African, black Africans, two million of them came to the United States in the last 50 years? Why would they move to a systemically racist country? It's a giant lie, America being racist. Of course there's racism in America. There's anti-Semitism in America. And as a Jew, I will tell you, and was one who taught the history of anti-Semitism on the college level at Brooklyn College and wrote a book on it. This is the least anti-Semitic country Jews have ever lived in. Of course there are anti-Semites here. There are bad people everywhere on earth. Doesn't make the entire country bad. All right. Did I hit, uh, I think I did, yep. Pretty strong arguments. But then, uh, then people are told, oh, but every white is racist. I mean, that's particularly an incredible uh, charge to make. All it is is projection. Any white who says all whites are racist is talking about himself or herself, not all whites. What a, what a stupid idea, all whites are in the history of the world, has there ever been such a... Are all the whites of France racist? <coughs> it's just... I mean, why isn't that a racist comment? As soon as you attribute any quality to all, all of the members of a race, that is the definition of racism. If you said all whites are brilliant, that would be racism. All whites are stupid is racism. All whites are racist is racism. The world is upside down, and I try with all my heart and soul to turn it back right side up. Okay, there we go. Take it away. Hi, my name is Kate. I'm 17 years old, and I just graduated high school. Um, I live here in South Jordan, Utah, and I'm a member of Prager Force. And I was wondering what your best counter argument is when someone brings up white privilege. Thank you. Pleasure to hear from you, Kate. White privilege is, is another one of these manufactured terms. Some whites have privilege. Some whites don't have privilege. Some blacks have privilege. Some blacks don't have privilege. There are so many privileges in the human race that are built in that this is... If you're brilliant, you have, you have a brilliant privilege. Uh, if you are athletic, you have athletic privilege. The, the, do, do, do great athletes not have the privilege of their, of their ability? 
I couldn't be a great athlete. I don't have that ability. Great pianists have built-in privilege too, but they work very hard. All of them, athletes, pianists, anybody. But you know what the greatest privilege is? American privilege. That's the biggest privilege. You're in the freest country with the most opportunities on the face of the earth, which is why so many people want to move here. That's real privilege. You want even a bigger privilege than that? How's this? Father privilege. You have a father in your life. You have a father and mother in your life, you're really privileged. And if uh, they're, they're pretty normal, every parent is a little screwy because every human is a little screwy. But if you have basically good parents, wow, are you privileged. 80% of, of black kids are born to, to uh, women who were not married to the man who conceived them. That's, that's a bigger problem than anything having to do with racism, anything. Why can't we say that? Isn't that demeaning to blacks? If you go to the doctor and he refuses to tell you what's really wrong, is he doing you a favor or is he hurting you? Oh, there are, there are all sorts of privileges. In terms of median, median income, whites are, are hardly the highest group in the United States. Asians, uh, uh, certainly, I think Japanese Americans, by the way, that's particularly ironic. Japanese Americans were, were in, 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 a, uh, in, in uh, prison camps during World War II. And, and look at how well they have fared. And by the way, put there by an icon of the left, Franklin D. Roosevelt. And I'm not blaming Roosevelt for it. I mean, it was wartime. I don't think, I think it was the wrong decision. But, that's a, that, but I, I, I wouldn't take down a statue of Franklin Roosevelt because of the, the internment camps for Japanese. There is no perfect figure from the past. None. Zero. You'll have no statues to anybody. But that, we'll talk about statues another time. White privilege. Why do, uh, why do white men commit suicide proportionately more than any other group in the country? I guess they missed the, uh, they, got, they didn't get the memo. You're privileged. Life is hard for everybody, or nearly everybody. So you either rise above it, you meet the demands and the, the challenges of life, or you blame society for why you're, you're not doing well. That's your choice. But you'll never grow up if you blame society. You'll never succeed, you'll never grow up. You'll just be angry. Okie doke. Matthew, 40, Seattle, Washington. Hi, Dennis. I'm an airplane pilot and a gay man who has been married to my husband for 10 years. I used to consider myself left-leaning because I thought the left was an ally to gay people. In the last two years, I have started identifying more with the right, thanks in large part to PragerU videos and fireside chats. Good. My gay friends do not agree with me, not as capitalized. How can I help them see that the left is not the ally to gay people they claim to be? Well, it, it, first of all, you know, Dave Rubin is the person that uh, they should really address this to because he's a gay who was liberal his whole life and has realized, whoa, uh, you know, uh, the left is not my ally. Not if I want a, a free society. I mean, okay, so now gays marry. Basically, even conservatives don't care if you're gay. All right now, I happen to believe because I'm a religious person. I do believe marriage should be defined as a man and a woman, for the record. I'm also my wife and I, at, dis, despite my belief in that, a gay couple that is married, two men, have asked my wife and myself to be the godparents of their children. So if they die, we rear them with our values. Now, how could that be? I don't even believe in, in same-sex marriage. But would I ever speak against the parents to these kids? They know I wouldn't. They know I would raise them with, with, with kindness and goodness as, as the most important values of life. And God-centered. I mean, th these battles are over. A gay, sh a gay American should ask, what's best for America? That's what everybody should ask. And then, and once they do, it's impossible to stay on the left. Impossible. Now, he's leaving. He's not even gay. He's, he's walking the circuitous route. See, he is so thoughtful, he is not walking out of the room 
via the camera. It's true. I don't know what he's doing. All right, be that as it may. A rare time that Otto got up in the middle. Actually, Otto's not been feeling well, to be honest. And he's on medicine, and it's, it's, uh, it has some effect. So I will send all of your best wishes to Otto, who will, undoubtedly will be touched. Yes, uh, there are so many gay conservatives, by the way, just to tell you, my friend. Uh, it's... It's very sad, but again, Dave Rubin would be a great person who I'm sure has addressed this. Rosie, 10 years old in New Zealand. How you doing, Rosie? Dear Mr. Prager, I have, you want to let uh, Otto out there? That'll be great. Otto is, uh, Alex is currently opening the door. I'm giving you a blow-by-blow description. And now, a rare time, I feel a little lonely. Otto's not next to me. People tuning in right now are going to ask, what happened to Otto? People will inform them, though. The comment section. The comments will inform them. That's adorable. (laughs) Dear Mr. Prager, this is from Rosie, who's 10 in New Zealand. I've been listening to the news lately and was wondering what your opinion is on why the media make things sound scarier than they actually are. I enjoy listening to you. Keep up the good work. Kind regards. Thank you, Rosie. Gives me hope that a 10-year-old on the other side of the world is watching the Fireside Chats and PragerU. So, why did the media make things scarier? Well, COVID-19 is a perfect example. Uh, I was watching uh, one cable network and uh, it was the headline, 32 states, this is in America, but it would apply anywhere. 32 states see spike in COVID cases. So what? They're testing more, so they'll see a spike. Anyway, who cares how many cases there are? To a certain extent, the more the merrier, because then more people get immune, and maybe you'll have herd immunity if there's a second wave. The issue is how many are dying from it. And, And it's very few anywhere right now. It's very few people. Israel just went back into partial lockdown, or most lockdown, So I just checked how many people died the other day or the day before in Israel, died from COVID. One. Is that a spike? Spike in cases, this thing's not going away. It's not disappearing just like that. So what? We we know much better how to uh, treat it. We know much better how to prevent it. But the media has an agenda. First of all, If the media say, don't worry, you're not going to watch them as much. If it bleeds, it leads. It's an old problem with media, television in particular. But they have another agenda in the United States, certainly, because if the economy comes back, it it makes the re-election of Donald Trump more likely. So they have an interest in suppressing the economy, and that is the next election. It's a tragedy, what I just told you, and it's actually evil. But nevertheless, I am, there's no doubt in my mind that it is a factor. Uh, I, I, for the record, as many of you know from Fireside Chats and my columns and my radio show, I thought we overreacted from the beginning. The, the number of people in the world who are, are on the brink of, of serious hunger, even starvation, because of the, uh, the collapse of the world economy is going to dwarf the number of people uh, who uh, have died of this, uh, of, of COVID-19. Am I, checking, am I checking with you on time? Oh, yeah. We're good? What? Good. Caleb, 15, Tucson, Arizona. Hi, Mr. Prager. My question is, if you were asked to define freedom, what would your, be your definition? Thanks for all the wisdom and insight. You have truly changed my life. Good, Caleb. That's all I want to do. It's why I never ran for office. I'm not interested in having power. I'm interested in having influence because I, uh, I have important things and good things to say to make people's lives happier and better. That's my business. That's what I care about. Anyway, uh, freedom, well, I don't... I, I don't think your definition and mine would, would differ that much. It's, it's, 
that you are allowed to do a great deal that until uh, you inflict intentional harm on another. The more freedom now. Uh, Good people could differ. For example, should you have the freedom to uh, use cocaine? There are very good arguments on both sides. Should should uh, there you be? Should we should we make uh, prostitution legal? There, that's that's a freedom issue. There are good arguments on both sides. So good people can differ on certain issues with regard to uh, liberty. Uh, that's where you have uh, people who are almost absolutist. Uh, just let people do anything they want as long as they don't directly. Uh, intentionally injure, or I guess unintentionally injure other people. Okay, that uh, that's that. I I tend toward that, with 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 a handful of, of exceptions, uh, but uh, I I certainly think the most basic freedom. To be very specific, there is there is one most basic freedom, and that is free speech. And the left has always suppressed free speech. There is no exception to that rule since Vladimir Lenin in 1917 when he took over Russia and became communist. And there was less free speech under the communists from 1917 to 1989 than, uh, than there was under the, the, there was less than under the czar. And the czar was a no piece of cake, a bad guy or a bad series of guys. Free speech is, the reason the left loathes free speech is because it will always be defeated whenever there is free speech. That is why it is so important to suppress conservatives coming to campuses or conservatives on YouTube or Google or Facebook or Twitter. Because the more free speech, the less effective the left is. Then they know it. William, 37, Santiago, Chile, or Chile. Was there a number of times. I had a great time. Thanks for all your work. By the way, I just for the record, I I have to believe Chile is the strangest, physically strangest country in the world. It is one gigantically long, thin line. It's look look on your maps. It's fascinating, Chile. It's on the other side of the Andes Mountains. Uh, to uh, Argentina, and it's uh, that's that's why there's that story of the uh, was it the Chilean rugby team? I think it was that crashed into the Andes, and then they that's where you have the famous case of where they ate some of the fellow passengers, which they had to do. I, I never understood why that was a moral dilemma. They didn't kill these people to eat them, but life is precious. Let me announce that if, uh, if I'm in, a, in, in an air crash and the only thing you have to eat until you get rescued, if you do, is me, uh, I volunteer. Well, why is it better to deteriorate in, in, in the ground than provide the ability of somebody to live who would otherwise starve? I never understood. People ask odd questions. Gee, was it moral? It's a very famous story. You should look, look it up. I saw the movie. The movie is riveting. I don't remember the name of it, but it's just the Chilean rugby team. It's a true story. And by the way, when I spoke in Uruguay many years ago, the, uh, one of the members of that team who survived came to my speech. I'll never, I was very moved in Montevideo, and he asked how I could believe in God because he was angry at God for, for the death of his, of his comrades, of his fellow athletes. But of course, God didn't kill them. I told him that. It was a moving, moving evening. Anyway, thanks for all your work. Your clarity and calm are really an example to me. That's good, clarity and calm. That's right. Could you please give us practical advice on how not to lose hope when we see that our region is kidnapped by leftist corrupt regimes. Thank you so much in advance. You should never lose hope. I mean, people in the worst circumstances on earth have had hope. 
People in Gulag or Auschwitz, they, they, they had hope. Of course there's hope. I, there are no guarantees, but there is hope. But life is, is, is not, does not exist to guarantee good results. There are many bad results. My, my task in America, yours in Chile, is, is to fight for the good. And then the rest is in God's hands or, or in man's hands, but not in my hands. I, I recognize that. I, I, I'm very worried about America. Freedom is fragile. Civilization is fragile. Standards are fragile. Opportunity is fragile. Affluence is fragile. And it's all being challenged by the left. It's all being hurt, as they always do. But uh, my, my question is not, do I have hope? My quest, I never ask myself that. I ask myself, what do I have to do? And that's what you have to ask yourself. So with that, thank you very, very much for watching. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to keep these fireside chats free, please do by donating to PragerU.